Hello, everyone. We're just getting everyone in from the waiting room. Um, so thank you for being patient with us, as always. Um, as we are getting everyone in, I'm just going to begin with my little introduction. So um, hello and welcome to episode seven. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And we are going to begin today with a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute and its school, Phillips Academy, are on. So Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Pen Pe Beth, Penacook and Patuxet people and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconoke, and Nipmuc nations. We honor all indigenous people who are here now, have been here for a time immemorial, and will be here in the future. And we acknowledge indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. And we understand how education has been used by settler institutions in the attempted erasure of indigenous people. And we commit to interrogating the histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering native voices and communities, and dismantling the ongoing legacy of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. So join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through June for our presentations. And for a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at peabody.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. And if you are enjoying our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. And so today we are very excited to welcome Dr. Troy Lovato. Um, he is a professor at the in the University of New Mexico's Interdisciplinary Honors College and Research Faculty um, at, in UNM's Southwest Hispanic Research Institute. And he was trained as an anthropologist and archaeologist, um, getting his degrees at the University of Texas um, and Colorado State University. And much of his research and teaching has been focused on non-textual forms of presentation and the social role of material culture and the cultural landscapes, including trails, border regions, and mountains. And his writing includes the uh, books, Inauthentic Archaeologies, Public Uses and Abuses of the Past, and with art historian Elizabeth Olton, Understanding Graffiti, Multidisciplinary Studies from Prehistory to Present, and during and at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen or the chat function. And then we'll give our speaker time to answer as many as they can with the understanding we might not get to all of them. But again, welcome, Dr. Lovata, and thank you for joining us today. So oh, thanks exciting. for having me here. Yeah, I'm really happy to, you know, be able to talk to you and all the rest, everybody who's, you know, watching and listening in. So, yeah. Um, welcome from, I'm in Albuquerque at the moment, the University of New Mexico. And so what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of marking place and the idea of how we, we can look at what is essentially graffiti and something that's sometimes thought of as very, you know, ephemeral or throwaway or not allowed and trying to understand what it reflects back to people. And so yeah, this will be hopefully an interesting journey to you. And very specifically, we're going to be talking not just in general about this, we're going to talk about arbor glyphs, which are carved trees. And I want to talk about an idea of a Chicano or a Latina Latino experience um, in the Western US and what that means for archaeology and kind of broader in a lot of different ways. So if you don't mind, I've got pretty pictures. So let me bring them up here. Um, that's one of those archaeological things that you always want to do. So let me, let me start up a nice slideshow. Okay, so, you know, when people talk about graffiti, we often think of something that starts, whoops, starts from the 1970s, 1980s New York, or someplace like that, maybe London. Um, and then that idea of writing on train cars, writing on walls of a big urban area, um, are how a lot of people think about graffiti. And the impact of that exists today. 
Um, of these three images here, the one on your upper left is actually from Albuquerque. And it shares something from the 1980s with this train car that was painted, I think 1983 um, in New York City. And often we think about this idea of very urban, your spray can painting, maybe you're using markers or etching on a train car somewhere. And one of the things is that this captures our understanding of graffiti so well in culture that sometimes people become blind to what it is that graffiti is. Um, fundamentally, it's about marking place. It's about people out there. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps when you talk to people who think about culture, um, archaeologists have actually been pretty good about kind of redefining and understanding graffiti isn't just necessarily urban or it's not just necessarily something that happened from 1970 through today. In fact, archaeologists have found graffiti thousands of years old. Um, we have found graffiti in places that are decidedly not urban, um, out in the middle of what even is legally thought of as wilderness today. And so archaeologists really have played with this idea of graffiti. And it's not surprising, because sometimes graffiti is things that gets etched onto rocks. It's not just spray paint. Um, it's kind of blends into areas of like rock art. Um, but it also tells us about culture. Often we think about graffiti as something that's maybe technically truly illegal, or at least not allowed, or no permission was given. Um, these are a lot of definitions of what it means to make graffiti. Um, and when we start thinking about that, we're like, hey, that's a little bit of a way to have insight into what's maybe not the official story. Uh, what are people who aren't in charge leaving as a message? And so there's been a lot of work from all over the world, places in the ancient Mediterranean, like Peter Keegan's work, um, places in the US here, um, and thinking about it in a very archeological way in the last about 12, 15 years has produced some really interesting work on graffiti. Now graffiti could be urban and it can be on walls, but I wanna talk about graffiti on trees. And so we as archeologists, we've come up with a nice term for this arbor glyph. Um, which just basically means tree writing. Um, this is an aspen tree from um, the Santa Fe National Forest. Actually, it's right next to the, the Santa Fe ski area um, and it's hearts written on trees. And not surprisingly, when we think about it, you know, um, people are marking trees and they've done it for thousands of years. You can go back to things like um, Shakespeare in some um, talks about people, lovers writing their names on trees. Um, Virgil has some poetry of ancient Greek sheep herders who are writing about being sheep herders on the trees around them. And it even comes up into a modern day. People are still marking trees with things like, I was here, this is my special other person, we're gonna draw a heart around it. And this is a pretty interesting process. And it's pretty interesting to think about because um, the trees themselves and the landscape they're on also reflect something back, not just the sentiment being expressed. So we're gonna talk about, especially here in the Mountain West, um, primarily aspen trees. And as you can see right here, um, aspen trees are a nice graffiti surface because they're relatively smooth. I mean, not perfectly. Um, they're relatively easy to carve into. You can actually make a carving with your fingernail if you've got a relatively sharp one. Um, and they're kind of a nice canvas, um, but you know, that's, that's what we're gonna look at. There'll be some other trees as well. And this is the kind of thing you see on a carving in graffiti in a, in a grove of carved trees. People's names, people's hearts, dates, places. Um, this picture on the left um, in the middle, um, it says Tony Abeda, Ledoux, New Mexico. And this is actually in Wyoming. Um, and it's actually done by a person who was working in Wyoming in the early 20th century, who is from New Mexico. And we're gonna talk a whole lot more in a little bit about this whole process. Um, but often it's things like initials, I was here. Um, now you also get some interesting things like the concept of the world around them. Um, in this other image, this is also up in Wyoming. Um, this is a carving of a snake. Um, things they see, things they want it to be. And basically we need to think about what arbor glyphs are. They're basically people leaving their messages on a relatively permanent um, and relatively easy to work with surface. They fit into a much larger idea of what archeologists have worked with, um, which is a thing called culturally modified trees. And in different places that can mean different things, like changing the structure of the tree, actually bending it, making it grow in different ways. In the Pacific Northwest here in North America, um, it can be things like harvesting pieces off a live tree and actually keeping it alive. 
Um, in other places, it can be painting on or carving onto. And so, you know, we're pretty good at categorizing as archaeologists, um, and we can fit it into this broader idea of that the cultural um, impact on these living trees around us. And in North America and in this area in the Mountain West, it's a lot about marking place. It's about, about giving meaning to the place you're at. Um, there's been some really good research in the last yeah, 10, 15 years about culturally modified trees and aspen trees um, here in the Mountain West. Um, Malaya Olatze um, produced just a massive store of information about carvings on aspen trees around sort of the, the states that border Lake Tahoe. Um, and we're talking tens of thousands of recorded trees. Primarily, he was looking at Basque sheep herders who came into that area um, and what they left on those trees, the impact of them. Um, in Colorado, Stephen Baker had done a really excellent job of looking at a very particular, um, specific um, sheep herder and artist, Pacamillo Chacon, and looking at how he left just hundreds upon hundreds of really elegant, masterful um, tree carvings throughout that whole area. And so these are give us some direction to build on. Um, and in a lot of ways, there's been a lot of research that in, in the US West with carved aspen trees um, and lately a lot of projects with things like the Forest Service Passport and Time projects in different areas. Um, but it is worthwhile to step back and say, there are carved trees in other places and they aren't all aspen trees. Um, this palm tree is from um, Kirshner Island, um, right next to Aswan, Egypt. Um, and I don't have a good translation of what's written on it. Uh, if somebody wants to shoot me a, you know, shoot me an email if you know any Arabic. Um, the next to it isn't a tree at all, but I think we need to expand that idea of leaving our mark on nature. Um, this is on a cactus um, in Makapu'u on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. Um, and so this idea that you can leave your mark on nature means something. Um, the trees and even things that are tree adjacent, like a cactus, becomes a canvas to what's there. Um, and there has been some research around the world about different places that people carve on trees. Often they share a thing like this palm tree that like it's a relatively easy canvas to carve on. It provides something. You know, we don't see a lot of pine trees with carvings because the bark is pretty rough. Um, but that said, let's talk about what I'm looked at for about the last 10 years or so. And really what I've been looking at is carved aspen trees in the, the basically the Rocky Mountains. And this Intermountain West area um, from Northern New Mexico into the adjacent parts of Colorado. And if you know a little bit about the sort of history of these areas, um, although that Colorado border um, between New Mexico and Colorado, there's a lot of cultural interaction up into the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado. And we'll even see that in some of these trees as well. And then um, I, I mentioned, I just showed a, a slide of Pacamillo's work, uh, Pacamillo's carvings in Colorado. But if we jump a little further north into far Northern Colorado and into the, the Medicine Bow Route National Forest in Southern Wyoming, um, I've done a work there as well. And these have a connection back to New Mexico that I'll talk about. Now, in this area, um, the, the trees that get carved in this area are aspens. And that's what dominate um, kind of a lot of research in this area. And I mentioned it already. These aspens are places that um, you can go to and you can carve relatively easily. Um, and they last relatively well. Now, we need to think about the aspens in a wider context as well. There's been a lot of writing about you know, what it means to be in an aspen grove and um, even poetic writing and things like that. And if you've been in an aspen grove, um, different times of the year, it can be vibrant golds and yellows and reds in the fall. It can be vibrant and green. It can be stark in the winter, although it'll have no leaves, you'll still see those white um, aspen bark. Um, aspens get nicknamed quakies. And there's a very particular sound of being inside an aspen forest. And we need to think about that as well. And it's one of the things that I've really you know, pushed in kind of the research looking at carved trees and looking at arbor glyphs. It isn't just the carving itself, it's a wider contextual idea. Um, so these aspen carvings have dominated a lot of research in the Mountain West. And it's not surprising because there's thousands upon thousands of carvings out there in this area. Um, here on the left is probably one of the oldest sort of pieces I've seen people doing research on aspen carvings. Um, a folklorist named James DeCorn um, put this book together in 19, 
69, Aspen Art in the New Mexico Highlands. And what he was looking at is he was looking at carvings um, that were primarily left by sheep herders um, around an area in northern New Mexico, area around El Rito, which is sort of north of Española, a little south of Taos. And um, it was mostly a photo essay, but he was a folklorist. And published as it did, there were some carvings that went back into the uh, 1800s. Um, and a lot of that is to kind of understand how long aspen trees live. Um, here in the Mountain West, aspen trees grow a little slower than other places, but that also means they last a little longer um, because it's higher altitude and drier. So um, in general, it's you're not going to find a living aspen tree that's probably more than 120 years old in this region. So it's historic, um, but it's very much archaeological. Um, and so, for instance, this picture on the right, um, this is one that I recorded. Um, it's basically, if you break it down, we can't quite read the guy's name on the first, first line, um, but it's the 6th of July, 1905, is carved onto this tree. Um, so, you know, you're pushing it past 110 years old. And it's not, not unheard of to sort of find these trees around. And to even find dead trees with carvings that go back even another decade or so before they fall and totally deteriorate in this area. And so um, there's been a lot, a lot of knowledge. And if you've ever been hiking in the Mountain West, you often run into this. And probably some of you might even admit to carving your name or carving something on an aspen tree. Um, a lot of the carvings that get looked at, much like decorn or other people, they're related to sheep herding. And we need to kind of think about the history of sheep herding in the Mountain West. Um, in the 1800s, Sheep was king in a lot of parts of the of the this mountain west area. Um, there were cattle. Um, there were other things being raised, but the the sheep flock numbers are pretty amazing. Um, one county alone, Rio Arriba County um, in New Mexico, at one point in the late 1800s into the early 20th century, or um, had four and a half million sheep in one county. Just to kind of put that in perspective, that's like twice the population of New Mexico's people today. Um, and that was one county alone. And so there was this dominant industry of sheep herding and it spread throughout the region. Now um, there were ups and downs and into the early 20th century was some ups that then cattle became more important. Um, the Taylor Grazing Act changed some of the open lands um, and what was accessible to people. And then pretty much in a sense of globalization um, after World War II, um, other places became dominant in sheep herding. And so things like Australia, New Zealand, having massive global sheep industries um, sort of put the sheep industry on the, the downside in the Mountain West. And today you see a lot of cattle and you don't see a lot of sheep, um, but the history is there. And you saw a lot of carvings left by sheep. And I think there's maybe an attraction to thinking back to the past and thinking back to what not that long ago, but it's now pretty historic, um, was once the way that people made their livings. Now, carvings are what you might expect. They're names, there's dates, there's places for a lot of people. Um, and it's not surprising that that's close to other forms of graffiti, you know, sort of I was here in some ways. But as we look closer, there's these things that give it other idea and context. For instance, there's actually a fair amount of carving that is directional. And this is maybe very different if we think about other types of graffiti. Um, one of the, let's see, the upper right on the screen here, it's actually the word water with an arrow. And if you follow it off the trail, you'll go down to a natural spring in the Sandia Mountains. Um, in the lower right, um, written in Spanish, um, it basically says, no camina neta por aquí. And this is sort of in a saddle, um, an area north in Southern Colorado called Buckles Lake, just south of Pagosa Springs, north of Chama. Um, it was a very big early 20th century sheep herding area. And this little saddle has a little trail that you would probably think you could pull a wagon through, but yeah, a couple hundred meters up where the trail is from this sign, um, a series of rock benches means that it's only passable by foot. Um, the one, the large one on the left on the screen, are two arrows on a ridge um, going into the San Pedro Parks wilderness area outside Cuba, New Mexico. And the ridge has a nice trail, um, but it's pretty steep. And you just look off the trail to the little bit to the left and there's this nice little valley that you think could be maybe a better way to head uphill. Um, but you know, a quarter mile or so up that trail, there's rock fall and it's completely impassable. And so this carving on the left is actually an arrow scratched out to the left and an arrow saying, go right. And this is kind of interesting idea that it's, it's 
not just saying I was here, it's a whole series of sort of interactions with landscape and place. Um, this one is also in San Pedro Parks and um, it has the name Coyote with a spelling with double L's instead of a Y, um, New Mexico, which is a town not far from here. Um, but what I'm trying to show on this picture is actually to the right, um, it overlooks what you can kind of see in the trees in the background is a broad open area. And if you're herding, that's where the animals are. Or if you're hunting in the wintertime, that's where, um, that's where the other animals are, the non-domestic ones. And so um, it brings up this idea that it's not just about what's said, but we archeologists are really good about context. And um, it's about the placement, where you see it from, where it looks to, how it relates to the land in a larger way. And sometimes carvings are on trails and they're very much billboards. And I think they very much relate to how we think about graffiti as like, I'm throwing it up and I want everyone to see it. And I wanna write my name in the sky and everyone will know who I am. This one that says Coyote New Mexico isn't on a trail and it faces away from the trail. And it kind of makes us think about like, what's it mean to leave your mark when it's maybe not meant to be seen by everybody. Um, it's also not just about sheep herding and it's not just about, you know, the past. These are um, from the Santa Barbara Creek area near Taos, New Mexico. Um, one of them is a, looks like probably an elk, um, could be a deer, but there's a lot more elk in this region. Um, and it's an area that's pretty thriving elk hunting area. And then another one, if you know New Mexico, um, this is the Zia Sun, the state symbol. Um, and very much these aren't just tied to activity and tied to use, but they're tied to identity. Um, you're not just writing your name and you're not just maybe writing where you're from, but you're also understanding your relationship with place. And the, these arbor glyphs aren't just about, I was here. Sometimes they're about who am I and what does this place mean to me? Um, now, it also keeps going through today. Um, underneath uh, the picture of the elk, it's kind of the lower bottom of that, you can see it actually says 1990. Um, people still carve trees today, and it's part of the whole process. And it's not unheard of. It's not you know, surprising to find a tree that's got a 75-year-old carving and a two-year-old carving all together. And that also has something to do with connecting between past and present and place's role in how you feel about that. Um, now, there are a lot of sheep herding carvings. Um, these are all from Wyoming, and in some ways they reflect back to what we think about sheep herders. And one of the things we think about sheep herders are the lonely sheep herder. And we, we know often it was young males who were alone for months at a time um, with their sheep. And it's not surprising that you see things like carvings of what is not there, women. Um, carvings that are totally pornographic in nature are also something you see. Um, lots of naked women, poetry about the women who maybe wronged them or are they going to find in the future, complaints about prostitutes, things like that written onto trees. And so there is this relationship to sheep herders that we need to realize, and it has a pretty big role in what gets left there. Um, one thing when we talk about sheep herders, and this is something both I've seen myself, but you go through people's work like um, Malaya Latze looking at the Basque sheep herders around Lake Tahoe is the sheep herders almost never did carvings of sheep. It was always something else. Um, so this one on the left, which is a carving that actually says Borrego, um, is a horse. And the one, and that, and the one on the right um, is what seems to be a guy loading up a pack horse. And then also um, what seems to be carved on just hundreds of trees in this area around Buckles Lake, Colorado, um, are basically cow skulls or something like that as a little logo. And you almost never see the sheep themselves. And I think it reflects something about what they were doing um, and something about like what they were, where the place was at, I think. Um, so that's, that's one interesting kind of thing to think about in this whole process. Another thing that kind of dies into that is of course that you don't, um, sorry, that we don't see the sheep, but we often see sheep dogs. Um, this picture on the left is from DeCorn's book um, from 1969, um, and it's dogs smoking pipes. Um, and the one on the right is one I recorded of a dog um, along the Savory Stock, Stock Drive area um, in the Sierra Madres in Wyoming. And you see a lot of carvings of people and dogs. And it's not surprising if you're the lonely sheep herder. Um, you know, I don't know, you hate your dogs and you love your, you hate your sheep and you love your dogs. And I think this goes back 
a long ways in, in ideas of like the faithful sheep herding companion. Um, if you've ever, ever read any John Muir, like his first summer in the Sierras book, um, where he just, he gets a job as a sheep herder, but he despises every minute of the sheep. And he talks about how dogs are these really interesting kind of between domestic and natural and things like that. Um, so even though they're sheep herders, you know, we're not finding sheep. And I think as archaeologists, this is maybe akin to things like, you know, when we look at rock art, we have to step back and say, it's not just what is there, but it's also what is not there. Um, and it's not an easy one-to-one -one relationship to kind of understand these carvings. Now, um, sort of talk about my own perspective in some of this. Um, I have somebody, I've grown up in the Mountain West. I was born in Wyoming and you know, went to school in Colorado for undergrad. I've got relatives in, all across this area. Um, and one of the things that, you know, is just being here when I hiked around, even when I was doing other kinds of archaeology, I was seeing carvings on trees. Um, but the other thing is it's also an understanding of a larger history of place. And this is where I want to talk about um, Chicanas and Chicanos in, in the Mountain West. Um, and after looking and recording a lot of trees in, in New Mexico, um, one of the things I sort of grew into and stumbled on in some ways is a project called Following the Manito Trail. And this is an oral and sort of family history project. Um, primarily, it's run by um, some scholars at now Arizona State University. They were at the University of Wyoming, Vanessa Fonseca Chavez, um, and, and uh, some people here at the University of New Mexico, like um, Levi Romero, who's a poet. Um, and the idea behind this, if you don't know what the term Manito is, is it's a very northern New Mexico term, and it means sort of worker or even brother in some ways. And they were building a project looking at the oral history of people who left New Mexico to work somewhere else. Um, if you think back into your history, um, New Mexico you know, has an interesting history as part of the US and even before it. Um, it has this deep Spanish and even Native American roots to the place. Um, even when it becomes a territory and later a state, it's always a little bit different. It's always understood in a different way. Um, and from the 1850s or so till about the 1950s, um, New Mexico wasn't a very economically vibrant place. And a lot of people in New Mexico left for places like Colorado or Wyoming or Arizona or California to get jobs. But when they left, they were a diaspora. They often kept their connections back to New Mexico. They talked about them, they went back to them. And this oral history project following the Minito Trail was all about recording those connections. Now I have those connections as well. Um, my grandfather was born in Hernandez, New Mexico. Um, and 1908 when he was born. Um, and 1920s, early 1930s, he moved up to Wyoming to work. Um, he worked on places like this is a photo of him in 1930 at Pole Creek Ranch. Um, he worked as a rancher, he worked as a stockhand, later he moved into town. He worked on, um, he worked in places like um, butchering animals, cutting hair, tending, um, tending boilers. Um, during World War II, he helped build airplanes at the big United facility in Cheyenne, but he was always connected back to New Mexico, even though he made his home in um, Wyoming. And a big part of the Falling Manito Trail project was to think about what it meant to go to a different place, but also be connected back um, as Hispanics and as Chicanos and what it meant to work there and what it meant to make a new life or not. Um, and it's about identity. Now, this is a tourist map of Wyoming. Um, and if you look around the state of Wyoming, one of the things you see is little vibrant orange trees, and those are aspen groves. And aspens are a tourist resource in Wyoming and something that defines the place. Um, and right there in the, the south center of the state, um, just west of Laramie, um, in, the, in the Medicine Bows and in the Sierra Madre Mountains, um, kind of near, showing near Riverside Encampment, Wyoming, is an area with a massive amount of aspen and a massive amount of carved trees. And it's actually a scenic byway um, in, designated by the state of Wyoming. But it's also a point of how the history of people moving into the place, and in a lot of ways, the unwritten history um, of people moving into the place. These are some carvings in that area of the Sierra Madres in Wyoming. And what it basically says is the town of Arroyo Seco, A Seco, or Taos, and Taos, New Mexico. And the trees in this grove are totally filled with that. And so from the 1850s or so to about the 1950s, a tremendous number of people from Wyoming, primarily Hispanics, um, came to Wyoming to work. 
and they worked in sheep herding. They worked in extractive industries like lumber. They worked in the big beet fields and things like that, but they also moved into cities. Um, and there's this interesting history that's both understood and not, and a lot of it is family history and oral history. And unfortunately, when you start looking at the histories of Wyoming, um, often the Chicanos and Hispanos in Wyoming don't exist in the official histories. Um, and this is a pretty interesting thing to think about of why that exists as a, a phenomenon. Um, you know, we've, we've got this place in Wyoming that has stuff from Wyoming, um, or stuff from New Mexico, sorry. And it's not really recognized in things, even things like census records don't talk necessarily about people being from Wyoming, even though they're working there. And in a very racist way, they'll be described as things like Mexicans or Spanish and not Americans. And this is often in the 1930s, well after New Mexico's statehood. Um, now, I said there's sort of this lack in history, but one thing that's interesting in this area is there hasn't been a lack of understanding these people were there um, in Wyoming and also areas like Colorado um, by archeologists. Um, these are some cultural properties forms from a passport in time um, early 2000s um, project that was recording up in, in South, South Central Wyoming and recording all these people leaving their names, leaving their places and seeing them connect down to the Minitos who came from New Mexico. Um, and in Wyoming, the archeologists have a couple decade, actually probably like 30 or even 40 years of work recording those. And one thing that was really interesting when I sort of started looking up there is the archeologists would write reports and they would talk about them. And there was no flow from what the archeologists were finding to the historians. Um, you could go and look at the SHPO office's website um, in Wyoming. And often it talked about the history of sheep herding, but it didn't talk about the New Mexicans that were there. Um, but the archeologists were generating all this stuff and there wasn't communication. Now it's changed a little bit in the last couple of years, which is a positive thing. But this is a reflection of the stories we tell versus the stories we see as archaeologists and the artifacts that were actually there. And I said this was genuinely racist and I, you need to kind of put yourself back into the time of what's going on. Um, in, during the Great Depression and before and after it in this area, um, we, we don't realize in a sense how racially divided sometimes the Mountain West was. Uh, we don't think about things like the fact that, you know, that people who were explicitly members of the KKK would have been the mayor of, Col of Denver, Colorado, the biggest city in the region, or that um, explicitly maybe tied into that people who were powerful in the KKK were the governor of Colorado. In 1936, in the depths of the depression, um, the governor of Colorado declared martial law explicitly to keep poor people, and I would argue explicitly to keep um, Chicanos and Hispanics out of the state, out of traveling through the state, out of working in the state, and is a pretty powerful thing to think about, declaring martial law and not allowing um, other Americans to travel into your state. Um, and what this meant was he literally hung the signs up at the border and put the National Guard up at the border and primarily turned away people who they were called Mexicans, they were called Spanish, um, but they were also, were they coming into work, especially itinerant jobs, um, if they couldn't prove they had any money. Um, this is a one of many um, telegrams that got sent to the governor um, after he declared martial law by one of his functionaries, Kimball, and it basically says, you know, this is from, let's see the date, April 28th, 1936, um, 23 turnbacks, that means at the border, yesterday, 13 being sheep shearers entering through Durango, and that's Durango, Colorado. Um, and if you look through some of these telegrams, they're very explicitly about people who are the, the Manitos going to work in these areas, and they're seen as interlopers, they're seen as stealing our jobs. Um, they're seen as we need to actually keep them out. And I think this reflects a lot about our own time today, but I think it's kind of a lost history about the place um, that you can be American, but not really get the, get what's going on in America, get the, the full rights and possibilities. Um, and for me, this is a pretty important part about this project because this is a carved aspen tree on the left. It's a little hard to read. It's got the name of a guy, um, Jay Mares from Mora, New Mexico. And it's dated nine, probably nine, nine. So September 9th, 1931. Um, and in the midst of that, you know, sort of Great Depression, he's going up to Wyoming to work. Um, and in this area, it was primarily sheep herding. 
Um, and the history is written on the trees, but it wasn't really written in the history books. And so in 2017, there was a special issue of the Annals of Wyoming um, that got put together about the, the, the impact and sometimes ignored impact of Latinos in Wyoming. And it was really important for me that the project I was doing recording Aspen trees was part of this bigger thing that talked about oral histories, that talked about dance, that talked about quilt making, that talked about all these other things that we can think about as you know maybe a wider Chicano, Chicana studies. Um, and it was part of that process. And I think this is a pretty important thing when we think about archeology span and archeologists um, and what we do and where things are going. To me, looking at this, these arbor glyphs shouldn't stop with the archeologists in a camp because it tells a pretty interesting history. And it tells the history that then didn't get written in other places. And early on, I mentioned you know, that it was um, in some ways graffiti is the not necessarily allowed or sometimes very explicitly not allowed history, but it's sometimes understood that graffiti is where if you don't have the resources to leave your mark or write something or draw something in another way, you do it in that way. And it becomes very political. It's something to think about. Now, it's not also something to the past. There's very little um, sheep herding. There's not as much movement into Wyoming um, by people from New Mexico anymore. Occasionally they move up there to work, um, but it's also a global story as well. So the picture on the left, um, this is some writing um, in Basque writing, and it's from about 1950 is what it seems to be. And after World War II, um, there was a shift both in New Mexico and in the wider world. And sheep herding went away a little bit, but it never fully went away in this part of Wyoming, and it still exists today. Um, but one thing that happened is the New Mexicans, the Minitos, were no longer the cheapest or easiest workers to get. And there was this whole series of workers in a global way that exists goes up to today, where post-World War II, people from Spain, um, people from the Basque regions of Spain and France came over um, to work a not always the greatest job. Um, after that, people from Mexico started being brought up as workers, as guest workers very much. Um, and today there's still some sheep herding going on in South Central Wyoming. And it's primarily Peruvians who are brought up as guest workers and work alone in this area. And that tree on the right, um, Thanks for your shit job. Um, it seems to be Manuel Vasco's, and 1993 is when it's from. And there's a fair number of pretty recent ones that people write on the trees after their year, or two years, or three years working as a sheep herder in New Mexico or in Wyoming is over. Um, and this ties the past of place into a much more global system to think about and to kind of think about what's there. Um, this is also kind of interesting to me because this is a 1993 carving at the top. And if you look to the bottom, it's pretty hard to read, but the bottom of the tree has a 1923 date and some other things on the side as well. And so history just piles onto itself. Archaeology piles onto itself. Now, in a wider way, for me, it's a really important idea. Also, what does it mean to be a Hispano or a Chicana, a Chicano in this area? Um, on one way, they sometimes were written out of history or called something other than being American. Um, there's a lot of things like some of those other telegrams describe people from New Mexico as Mexicans, um, and they're not. And at the same way, um, other researchers into the scholarship of Chicana, Chicana studies, like Jay Kosek's story of forests in northern New Mexico, or Priscilla Solis Ibarra's work um, with understanding that the environment and ideas of wilderness and ideas of being in the wilderness are part of a Mexican American experience um, is a pretty important thing for me to kind of think about. This stuff, and it's in a lot of these different wilderness areas, it's not in an urban place, but we often think about, you know, maybe coming in as an immigrant or moving to places like a big city like Denver um, as this experience into a different place and it's very urban, but there's something else going on here. And it's also about defining place. It's about making it your own or thinking about also, you can look at these arboglyphs and some of them are about coming here to work, but never coming back. Um, some of them are probably about like my grandfather, although I don't know if he ever carved any arboglyphs. He passed away um, just about 20 years ago. Um, about going to a place, making connections as a member of a diaspora, but also making a home in a new place. And that landscape and that place are something that's his as well. And 
this is a pretty powerful part of the process. Um, this is from that Buckles Lake area north of Chama, New Mexico, south of Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Um, it's the name Benigno Gallegos. Um, he was a really prolific carver and he seems to have been a sort of 1930s era sheep herder who came up year after year to work in this area. And he's carved an aspen tree leaf or an aspen leaf with his name. And for him, he understood the place. The place was a place he went to work year after year. He didn't live there year round, but it was also a place that affected him. And it was also a place that defined him. His logo becomes the aspen tree itself. And that continues in a lot of ways today. Um, it's not that sheep herding exists much anymore, um, but you'll go up there and you realize, for instance, looking at the dates of things, that there are people who are using the forest in times which aren't sheep herding times or using the forest today that aren't being herded, like in the winter, and you realize they're doing recreation or they're going hunting or they're going fishing and they experience wilderness in a different way, but it also defines them as well. And that's kind of where I wanna end with this talk at the moment and get into you guys, if you've got some questions, um, but it's this idea that we as archeologists can start looking at these artifacts, these arbor glyphs, these carved trees, and we can start connecting to much wider ideas of identity and place. And we're really good at context. And in a lot of ways, that's what these are about. It's not just the names on the carvings. It's not just the dates on the carvings. It's where they're at and how they relate to the wider world. So let's stop this for the moment and see what you've got. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you guys can, you know, type in your questions and everything. Um, we have a comment um, from Tom Thomas he says, my favorite Basque arbor glyph in the Lake Taco, Tahoe Basin was a self-portrait of a sheep herder carving the Basque goddess Mari on an aspen with a sheepdog watching him um, and a sheep below with the Basque words for, of course, a sheep goes ba." Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's pretty good. And, and it, you know, it's, it's this idea of like you're carving your existence, you know, you're defining yourself. Yeah. Now, it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, when I was looking in that area where Maleo Latze worked, um, often that area, you know, he recorded all these, there were very few that actually include sheep um, in them. So this is pretty interesting that he made, I think maybe a cartoon of it or something like that. Um, and it reflects back. Um, there's also a, an interesting self-published volume by a, a woman who had worked on a passport and time program um, in that area, also up into Oregon, where she not just saw Basques, but also Irish who were brought over to be sheep herders. Um, and one of them, when she, she actually went and in the, the 90s went and found, he was getting pretty old then, the, the sheep herder himself, he'd moved to California um, and asked him all about it. And it was this interesting thing about how like he talked about, he actually got hired as a sheep herder because everybody assumed the Irish were good sheep herders. He'd never done it before his life. He was from Dublin and it's the city. But all his carvings that they went back and found are all about defining himself as a sheep herder and defining himself as the person in that place. And he even gave him nicknames about it, you know, things like that. Um, now there are Basques in Wyoming as well, and both, you know, a little bit earlier, but like I said, even after World War II, um, you know, they were another sort of cheap source of labor, you know, that post-war Europe. Um, so yeah, that's pretty powerful. Um, one of my favorites from the Lake Tahoe Basin that Malaya Latze records, and this is this sort of circularity, is um, the Forest Service was, you know, not happy about sheep herders carving on the trees, even back you know, in the 1900s. And there's a carving on a tree in Basque that says, you will be fined $20 by the forest service if you are caught carving on the trees. And it's just the circularity of all that all is, is pretty powerful. Kind of oh, think. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Older arbor glyphs can be hard to decipher at times. Any tricks with helping out with that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, it, it's very hard to decipher. And what happens is it's, it's to how trees grow. You need to kind of think about that in some ways. One of the things is, you know, when a tree gets carved on and we think about how a tree grows, it grows up, right? Um, so the carving doesn't move up the tree very much, um, but it moves out because the tree gets wider. And um, the other thing is the tree heals up. Often a, a carving in an aspen tree can be done really lightly. Now, some of these are really deep. You can carve with an ax if you really want, um, but you can scrape a really nice carving with, a, um, with just a nail or even your fingernail or a really fine knife. And over time it scars and that's what grows. 
and it changes color. And over time, sometimes the scar can even heal a little bit. And one of the things that happens, um, and this to get to how you think about it and, and look at it, is as the tree goes wider, you can get this double effect. So for instance, like let's say there was a carving of my hand and over time, sometimes the tree, the scar grows between it and you start seeing double. Um, so you have to do some things like that, like, you know, think about what's scarring and think about what's not. Um, it's a lot the same, I think, with recording rock art. It's a, about looking at it with different light, different angles, different times of day. Um, there's been some experiment. Um, there's a project or a, a paper that a guy sent me from Poland. Um, he was looking at some World War I and World War II era carvings on trees there, um, where he was trying some things with um, non-visible light things like that. And he was actually having some pretty good, um, you know, pretty good things, especially seeing what we can't tell, but he was able to, you know, with the, with our, just our naked eye, but he was able to tell which carvings overlaid other carvings. And he was able to tell that, you know, that relative age of what got put up first. Um, so there's some of that. Um, I find it pretty useful to do things like take a photo and do a sketch and look at it in different light. And, you know, you have to kind of tie those all together. You know, some of these I, I pointed really quickly and this says, you know, 1931 or something. And it's not always clear in that photo. That's actually what it says. You know, it takes 10 minutes of staring there and, and playing with it and looking at it. And yeah. again, I, we don't really have much out in New England, but I would assume it's very similar to cemetery gravestone rubbings. Don't do that. Yeah. I mean, well, there's some interesting projects people have done. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, where they, you know, because obviously it impacts it. Um, there were some artists, there was an art show in in uh, Idaho where some artists who were looking at these, um, they actually did some, um, uh, it was some sort of rubber laid around the tree that dried really quickly, they pulled it off and then they did casts of the tree that got shown in a gallery. Um, and that three dimensionality was something they were able to play with. Oh, um, that's one of really the things, cool. Yeah, and one of the things that that's also important about is if we just look at these as things carved onto the tree, we're not thinking about context enough, and we should as archaeologists. So for instance, um, often the carvers played with the texture of the trees. And in a really basic way, for example, um, up in Buckles Lake, there was one where it was a full-size naked woman carved on a tree from the front. And then if you walk the back of the tree, she's carved from the back. You know, They're playing with front and back, but there's also ones that they take the curve into account. Um, there's one in Buckles Lake that we recorded where it's a it's a Virgin Mary and a baby Jesus, and the Virgin Mary is naked in the in the carving. It's a pretty crude carving, um, but one of the knots in the aspen tree is one of her breasts and nipples. Um, there's also one in Wyoming we carved. There's a picture of a duck where this sort of you know it's a knot, it's a little bump that you know it's basically. Um, an infection in the tree, and they use that bump to be the the uh, the beak of the duck. So oh. they also play with the three dimensionality. And you know, if we just think of them as words or pictures on a tree, we aren't thinking about them in three dimensions. So very yeah. cool. And that sort of um, the context. Uh, we have another question, yeah. sort of related to that. Since the graffiti is only about a hundred years or so old, um, and since censuses list jobs. Um, and the, some of the arboglyphs you've talked about have names. Have you been able to find anyone in censuses or other documents that might be the person who did the carving? Yeah, so, so I have- Has that yeah. revealed anything else about their carving that you might not otherwise- Yeah, think? so I haven't got there myself yet um, with some of these. I mean, it's somehow some of these projects work, um, but there has been some projects. Um, I know of at least one in Wyoming where they, I mean, in New Mexico, where they were very specifically looking through census rolls and were able to reconnect people and, you know, find out that somebody was listed as a sheep herder and then find out they were in that place. Um, and that's also, you know, you know, that's, that's pretty powerful to kind of think about as it reconnects them back. And I mentioned, you know, in some ways, um, that idea of defining identity. So um, Vanessa Fonseca Chavez is one person she's looked at, not just, you know, this sheep herding aspect, she was looking with the following Manito Trail project, a lot of things like people working in the beet fields, or working as um, maids and things like that in cities in Wyoming. And it was really interesting to see what they were or weren't listed in the census rolls. Um, because they weren't often listed as New Mexicans or Americans. They were called things like Spanish or Mexicans. Um, one of the, uh, one of the um, telegrams that went to a governor, um, 
Edwin Johnson of Colorado. I showed one, there's another one. And it says like, at the border, we stopped this many Mexicans and this many Mexican Mexicans. And it's like, okay, you know, this idea of what's identity and, you know, um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, wow. Yeah, it, it ties in in a really interesting way. So um, we have two comments um, that are sort of related. One is from Gwendolyn Christie. Uh, she writes, this is such a wonderful talk. And she's an archaeologist on the Medicine Bow route. And they are going to be re-recording the savory stock driveway in some ah. other arborglyph dense areas. And Excellent. She, <laughs> and she, well, she was wondering if she could get your contact information, but also there is a woman named Donna who works, who's an archeologist for ACR consultants and they're doing work in the Sierra Madres and they are um, recording arborglyphs for the stands, sandstone survey, survey area. And they are trying to create a context for evaluating arborglyphs. And she would also like your oh, Yeah, contact. definitely get in touch. I mean, I haven't <laughs> been up there now for a couple of years um, recording stuff. So, but like I said, there have been some really good projects up there, especially, you know, there were some really, you know, and, I, and yep. that savory stock drive area, like for instance, that picture of a dog that I showed was from that area. Um, so yeah, there's some really good stuff there. Um, definitely get in touch. I think I wrote, I just wrote in the yep. uh, comments my email. So certainly get in touch. And one of those things, you know, COVID sort of shut a lot of things down and I haven't kind of been doing any field work uh, for the last two and a half years or so. Um, but yeah, I would be totally happy to, to talk to you, you folks and kind of see about it, but also reconnect you in some ways. I mean, it's a pretty interesting process to think about. You as archaeologists are doing certain things, but it's really good to get that context and think in a wider way. Um, there's been a lot of understanding of what it means to be a Manito in Wyoming kind of place. We had a pretty interesting display at the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming a couple of years back. So um, yeah, I will definitely get in touch and I'm glad to see more stuff going on. Um, you know, and yeah, you know, one thing that kind of happens is new projects develop and I don't always know you know, who's there. So yeah, yeah no, excellent. excellent. I will get in touch. So. Uh Carl has a question. Has there been any work on Chinese writing on trees near gold mining sites? Oh boy, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, um, some of the stuff that I looked through the files of Malaya Latse stuff, and he did a huge number of, you know, Forest Service Department of Defense contract stuff um, in from, you know, from Nevada, um, California, Utah, that region kind of centering around um, Lake Tahoe. And I don't remember seeing anything, but he was really a Basque historian. He was really looking for Basque. Um, but I would not at all be surprised. Um, you know, the other thing, um, Pacamillo, I mentioned that book of the, the carver who was in Colorado, and um, he also did rock art. And it's an interesting thing to think about that someone in the 20th century doing rock art. We, you know, we think of that as prehistoric. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's both, you know, carvings in Chinese, but I don't know any myself. Um, but I would not be surprised. Yeah, exactly. I, I've seen some, you know, in other places more modern, you know, I've, I've looked at some trees just when I've been out hiking in Los Angeles and found things written in Chinese, um, written in Cambodian or Vietnamese. So yeah, it's there, you know, so. Uh, excellent. Uh, so the last question-ish is from Michael. Michael also works with Donna, so I'll let you all talk about okay, yeah. that project uh, offline. But he also notices the Aspen log in your office. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us maybe a little bit about what uh, that Yeah, was? so there is an Aspen log. It's actually on loan. Um, Adam Herrera, who was at the University of Wyoming, um, and Vanessa Fonseca Chavez, who was at Wyoming and now at Arizona State, um, I, they were doing part of a project um, and they, with the Wyoming Heritage Council, had a documentary film, and I got to be in part of that. Um, and so this was a fallen tree. Um, it's kind of hard to see. It's pretty heavy, so I can't move it closer, unfortunately. Um, it has a picture of a naked woman on it. Um, um, Adam was out photographing things for the documentary. And this tree looks to be probably from the 1930s based on what else was there. Um, and what had happened is it fell and it hit another tree and it never touched the ground. Um, and so it was completely dead and it had probably been there for at least a decade. Um, and so he got permission from um, the Forest Service to go harvest it. 
Um, and then it's been it's been in a couple um, museum displays and exhibit displays. Um, it was going to be in one um, up in Taos, just uh, which is going on right now at the Millicent Rogers Museum in Taos. Um, but because it's a naked woman and they get a lot of kids there, they decided not to not to display it. Um, so it got moved out of storage. Graders. And before it's been moved back, it's sitting in my office until we can move it back. So, uh, but yes, it's one of the many sort of naked women. It was also probably protected because um, it was the, the, the image of the woman was on the underside when it was laying against another tree. So it was actually didn't, you know, it didn't, um, you know, get weathered and things like that. So yeah, that's from that area, you know, um, eventually I suspect we have to give it back once it rotates through a few more displays. If you would like a couple hundred pound tree back, we'll see. So, yeah i love it well thank you um these were the questions everyone had yeah um, well and definitely those of you who want to get in touch i put my email there lovata at unm.edu and get in touch yeah so <laughs> perfect well thank you to uh dr lovata and thank you to our viewers for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which is on Wednesday, May 4th. And it, you know, may the 4th be with you when we are actually joined by Dr. Jane Baxter, who's going to be speaking about the archaeology of childhood. I don't think there will be any Star Wars in that, but you know, you never know with May the 4th. So um, and again, we rely on support of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So have a wonderful Wednesday, everyone. So thanks. Thank you.